All right, people. So this is Ross. Welcome back uh, to another episode of Fruit Talk. I'm gonna apologize in advance a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> do have COVID, and that is why we've. It's, it's been a while since I've put out a video, um, or a podcast. Actually, before I got sick, um, my motherboard died. Had to get a new motherboard, new processor, new new RAM, uh, new hard drive. So that was a mess. Um, tax season's been kicking my butt. But overall, uh, the season did start for me, and I've been very excited. There is definitely some things on my mind uh, that... Uh, I need to get through over the next couple of months. Um, so hopefully that works itself out. Uh, but other than that, I'm, I am really looking forward to this season. And I, although we've had some hiccups because, you know, spring has been delayed essentially. Um, and it's not because of the weather, it's because of the virus. Um, we are still rather on track and yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. Like I said, I'm excited for the season. So that's really what we're going to talk about in this, <clears throat> this video here, this episode is I want to talk, I want to go through the garden where everything's at really quickly. I, I do want to update you guys now that I can speak and, uh, have the energy to speak. Um, definitely not as clearly as I'd like, but it is what it is right now. I am very fortunate to not, you know, for this virus really to have not been that serious for me. Um, it was pretty intense the first couple of days and I don't wish it on anybody. I'll tell you that, um, I did get it, I believe, from getting a root canal done. <laughs> so that's another big thing that happened recently. I've had a weird the last couple months. It was I was pretty stressed out um, with my exam and all that, with also with tax season. Then we had a good period there for a bit, and then I had to get a root canal. My computer broke. Um, then I got the virus. So it's been weird. It really has. Uh, but anyway, everybody, I did end up getting it. My, my mom has it. My brother has it. My best friend got it. Um, so not ideal that any of this happened, but at least everybody that, uh, I was in contact with, um, and including myself, it was not serious. So I'm I'm good. I, I'm sure someone's gonna be um, a little concerned, but I'm I'm good. I, the only thing I have at this point really is like a, a sinus infection. I don't want to have to take antibiotics. Um, so I'm just kind of waiting it out, and maybe there is something I'm gonna take called the uh, olive leaf nasal spray if anyone knows anything about it let me know it's supposed to be kind of antibacterial antimicrobial i think one of the two or maybe both that may help with the with with the infection i don't know but it's a more natural remedy i hope um so yeah if anyone has any idea about how to solve a sinus infection without taking antibiotics, let me know. All right, so then what we're doing in this episode, again, I want to talk about the, the garden because things were kind of put on the back burner for a bit and things have just not been working out as well as I had hoped that they would. Um, I also want to talk about the figs. We're going to talk about the melons. We're going to talk about the tomatoes. We're going to talk about really the, the entire garden. Um... We're going to talk about, I think, 
the orchard as well, how everything looks right now, what's blooming, what are some of the things we've done. Because um, I haven't really made a video since it was like, since it's been warm. And it's been warm, believe it or not, for parts of April, it really felt like June. It's so strange how that works. And inevitably, it always ends up that April and May is just so poor, just so cold. When, oddly enough, a lot of times in March, you get like better weather than you do in in April and May. It's just, it doesn't make sense. But um, I wish the weather would stay warm, but it's, uh, we're pretty cold actually as of today and tomorrow and uh, we're getting down I think to 26 which isn't horrible it's not really a total uh, frost either that's that they're predicting so that's good but with everything at this point now in the yard it is the first of April at the time of filming uh, everything is awake for the most part I mean pretty much everything um, Things like the che, the persimmons, the pomegranates, the figs have just just barely woken up and are, are just now starting to leaf out. Um, everything else for the most part, oh, and the mulberry as well, which I need to really get myself, take some scion off of that, that Girardi mulberry because I want to do some grafting. And I don't want to mess that up. Uh, the scion's already starting to expand, which is not good. But I think it's still not, it's not the end of the world just yet. Um, <clears throat> so that's where I'm at right now, essentially, is everything's awake. If we were to get a frost, and I mean, I mean a hard frost, something that's light isn't going to affect my backyard really all that much and I learned that last year I forget the exact temperatures but I'm glad to sort of have went through that so now I know not to freak out but I would say if uh, we're really at 28 26 I'm pretty much okay it's when we get down to like really hard frost somewhere in like the low 20s um, or even if we saw the teens somehow you know, at this point, we're not really supposed to see a frost. Um, you know, the average last frost, you could say, is the end of April, the 22nd of April, even May 1st. But it's sort, it's really just unlikely. Historically, what I've seen, it's just unlikely. Last year was a crazy year. We did end up getting a late frost that came in. And actually, a couple late frosts that came in. And that was a mess, and I was a mess, and I was really worried that we were gonna, I was gonna lose a lot of my fruit. Ended up losing almost nothing. I think I lost my apricots, my plums, and things like that. But you know, those are kind of expected. You know, things like apricots and plums, peaches, even a lot of the stone fruits. People, people don't know this, but in different parts of the country, you know, that's not a guarantee every year. You know. Um, they flower so early. In fact, this year it was really cold for an extended period of time, which was good. It wasn't good for our men mental state, but in the Northeast this year, everything was cold for a while. And then a flip switched and we got warm. And then because we got warm, the ground thawed finally and everything started to wake up. Um, so, you know, that from that point on, basically... <clears throat> you're susceptible to frosts and of course the, the later you go the more the flowers open and the more susceptible you become so my apricots as of literally right now are being pollinated by parasitic wasps three to four different species uh, the bumblebees the actual wasps um, there's a lot of bees and different wasps out there pollinating those trees right behind it is the plums and the pluots those are now almost in full bloom just not there quite maybe i'm a week away and those will be in a very similar position and uh i wanted to do a garden tour um 
<coughs> especially while everything's blooming because it's really beautiful but you know that's not really what this what these fruit trees are, are meant for they're yeah they're beautiful at very select times of the year but it, it doesn't last long I don't think people know that either. You know, an ornamental cherry is going to bloom and have flowers on it a lot longer than an actual cherry tree. So, you know, I'm going to take what I can get and, and enjoy it while I can. Um, and I really am waiting for some of these things to flower, um, to have all their flowers open <clears throat> so that I can, of course, do my tour. And as I said, as the flowers continue to open and be in full bloom, there's different stages of this. We can look this up, but <clears throat> there is a chart that if you guys find my video from last year, you'll find that chart. Um, I don't remember what university it is, but there's some universities that put out, maybe you can find it here, Apple tree bloom frost chart here it is right here so this will tell you essentially what temperatures they can withstand and uh there's post bloom numbers as well <coughs> full bloom and there's different stages right the clusters uh first pink so right now i am in the with the apricots i'm in full bloom basically um they're not in the shuck yet because the petals are still there uh, once these petals fall off then we're in the shuck then we get our green fruits and um last year i had green fruits and the frost came in and I lost them all. We got down to probably around 25, 26 with a frost. So th this chart is accurate. Um, but a lot of other things weren't at this point and everything was fine. Other than the, uh, the plums and the apricots. Anyway, so the, you know, the <coughs> this stuff is just is in full bloom and everything else is sort of following um the peaches are after the pluots and the plums and then from there i'm not really sure what's going to be flowering next but uh the honeyberries certainly are are forming flowers right now as well and i imagine the cherries and the apples and the pears won't be too much further behind the peaches but as soon as the peaches bloom i'll probably do the tour because i think around that time the pluots and everything will be blooming and it'll it'll be uh it'll be a sight it is getting really beautiful out there which is you know part of the awesomeness of this I, as i said you know these things aren't bred for beauty but it is very beautiful to my eye um, a lot of plants are coming up, perennials, the, um, flower, uh, uh, the flowers are coming up. <laughs> um, <coughs> I don't <coughs> remember the flower bulbs. Yeah, there you go. Like things like crocuses and, uh, daffodils, Is it daffodils. I'm not sure, but all the, all the bulbs are coming up. Okay. Um, and it's just looking great. It really is. I'm, I'm really excited because I really want something that's been going on is the wind has been just destroying everything. It's been so windy here. Um, we even had like 50 mile an hour winds that came in and really wrecked up the, uh, the low tunnels. And that wasn't fun. I actually had a couple low tunnels. I had to reconstruct them. They're just not meant for that type of wind. Um, so, yeah, it's been a mess with those. And I, I have been sick, so I haven't really been able to kind of get them straight. 
Um, if things were right with a couple areas of it, I, I wouldn't be struggling as much as I have, but, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a problem to, uh, juggle life right now. But as soon as the trees start to leaf out, you know, the big shade trees and a lot of big foliage in the area really starts to leaf out, the wind will significantly decrease. So I'm hopeful that's going to happen soon because I'm tired of this wind. Uh, it's actually been not only hurting, you know, the, the, the low tunnels themselves, but um, also some of the seedlings I have underneath the tunnels and the garden beds. So um, I did plant pretty much all of the gardens. Let's kind of move on to that at this point um in terms of the orchard and things like that there's not a whole lot left i think to discuss everything made it through this winter there's no damage from what i can tell even the fig trees that were left there and weren't pruned they they made it through the winter time with no damage we didn't we didn't really get too cold this year i think it was either 10 or 14 i, I don't remember but everything's good everything's cleaned up everything is uh looking great and then I guess when I do my tour I'll show you guys everything that I really wanted to point out one big thing this year we've talked about is the strawberries how I wanted to do that that whole thing came together I hope to have a video out on that very soon where we're covering the strawberry beds with a hinge door like a screen door that way there's no slugs no birds no other animals that can get in the water can um, and all I have to do is open up the door to harvest, close it back up. Very simple. Really, really well done. Transplanted all the strawberries over there. They're in a much better spot now. Easier to harvest, uh, easier to care for. You name it, it's so much better. Um, what else? The, uh, the honeyberries are looking really good, by the way. I noticed that. I'm excited for the Gumi. I'm excited for the Gooseberry. There is some uh, Yosta berries as well that are looking pretty good, getting some age to them. I may have actually seen, by the way, some pawpaw flowers out there. I can't tell. They're in the very, very beginning. The buds look different, that's for sure, than the other buds, but I can't really tell. It's too, a little too early. Um, I'm probably most excited, though, this year about... If it is indeed a pawpaw flower, I'm excited about that. But who knows if I'll even get any. Just because I have flowers doesn't mean I'll actually ripen fruit um, or have fruit that is pollinated. I'm, though, most excited is for the apricots. It's one of my favorite fruits. They are so, so good. And my one tree is pretty well covered in them. Um, not as much as I'd like to see, but... It is a young tree, and to me, that doesn't matter. Um, also have some uh, Asian pears this year that look like they're going to. Uh, the the one pear tree is actually covered in flowers, so hopefully they get pollinated. Um, I'm also very excited for a couple berries. Um, there is the Marionberry, which really, really, really impressed me last year. We'll talk about that. I'm excited to see the uh, potentially some pomegranates, I hope. The Girardi mulberry, we'll get to see that, I think, to some at some capacity. And overall, I think what we're going to do, really focus on, is not letting any animals get anything. Because <laughs> as soon as the birds find out and figure out stuff, it's over. Um, Got to really stay on top of that. So who knows? We'll see. Um, those are the things I'm most excited for. And uh, <coughs> I'm really just excited to eat fruit for my own garden. You know? Uh, I would like to have more alpine strawberries. I know someone asked me for an update or something. But I don't have any red alpine strawberry plants anymore. It seems like they... When I transplanted them out, they died, and that was a shame. 
Oh, you know what I'm I'm really excited for as well as those grapes because them grapes are so good. And I have a vine on the side of the house that's looking really good. That's an Everest seedless, it's called. Um, also, the Mars grape looks fantastic. The other two struggle. And I don't know what it is. I have to figure that out because I can't really get the wood sometimes to lift. It just doesn't make sense. Um, we'll also get some more muscadine grapes. They're looking much better, much more mature. Um, I'll get to try some apples this year. I, I don't know why. Uh, what's been happening in the past is the squirrel. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, really fence everything in this year because I'm tired of certain things getting my crops, especially before they're even ripe. So I'm gonna fence in with chicken wire like the whole yard. Um, you know, it is it it is what it is. But I'm gonna have to do it. Um, it's a real shame to have to go through that, but yeah, I'm gonna have more peaches and apricot and uh, nectarines than I really know what to do with as well. So that's gonna be a problem. Um, I'm telling you that that peach, those peach trees are loaded. The Espaya peaches, I've never seen more peaches every year just gets more and more um and this year for sure i'm gonna have so many that i don't know what to do with them so i'm gonna be giving a lot away and uh yeah it's gonna be a crazy year for peaches i think but even if we get a frost i think i'll still have a crazy year because even the trees in the front of the house are looking insane um so yeah enough about the orchard i think um let's move on to the garden uh the garden's planted out for the most part i have to transplant in snap peas i transplanted them in already and then we had this crazy windstorm and and a lot of them got destroyed by the plastic and the wind um a lot of this stuff here came up well but it, it, some of it did get a little damaged which is unfortunate but this is really just here to try all of this to see if any of it's good I know the end div is, but uh, we're going to see where some of this other stuff ends up. Um, we're actually going to get some Savoy cabbages, believe it or not. Um, there is some broccoli rob that I've been harvesting. The fennel is the other thing in the garden that really didn't look too great that I didn't transplant out just yet, um, as well as all of the brassicas. Really, really unfortunate. But essentially what has been happening, um, I thought it was just a lack of, uh, well, I started my brassica seedlings and the fennel seedlings um, in 120, 28 cell trays. So these big trays with very many small cells in it, you fill up the cells with the soil, you plant your seed. And then you can up pot them into a larger pot. And I did that. But I found out the reason why some of the seedlings weren't doing well, particularly the brassicas I just mentioned, is because they weren't getting enough water. And the cells, the water was not penetrating down all the way through the cell. And part of the cell was dry, or other parts of the cell was wet. So that was a real mess and a lot of that has to do with the soil i was using just natural soil conditioner believe it or not didn't work out for me but i think even the bigger reason that didn't work out was first off i don't think it's enough soil in there but it is possible to make this work if i indeed had my water out my outdoor water turned on sooner i was watering everything with a watering can and I go out there and water it and then go to the next thing water it and it just it wasn't enough water if I had a hose and I could really spray the, the stuff it would have been much better um, I ended up losing a lot of onions actually because of that didn't have enough water and that was totally unrelated they had much more room to grow and they also are very heavy feeders. I knew that, but I didn't realize how heavy of feeders they were. I gave them some food. So they didn't look great. And 
that's kind of not looking great as things like the fennel, the brassicas, even this stuff here, and uh, in the community garden as well, actually is the the onions that I started. So I got plenty of onions that I can transplant, but it still doesn't look, it didn't, it does not look in great for them. So unfortunate, I don't know what to do. I think it's just too many onions in a small area. I think I need to, pro I probably should have given them some liquid fertilizer a lot sooner. The other thing that's not looking great is the German butterball potatoes. I got them in the mail and I was going to green sprout them, cut them in half. So you have enough plants with enough eyes on it. You let them sit there in a warm, somewhat sunny location, and then they start to sprout. And the bottoms where you made the cuts start to dry out a little bit, harden up. But they don't look very good. And I, I don't know what it is about that. But I, so, I must have messed up or something. Maybe it's fine. I'm just worried. But they don't look good. Every single one that I cut really, really, really doesn't look good. And I wonder why that is. They really seem to dry it to dry it out. Um, I thought I followed the, the directions exactly. I don't know. I've done it like this before, and I haven't had this this issue. So I don't know what's going on, but uh, hopefully my potatoes aren't ruined. You know, so there's like a lot of things kind of not going right here, but everything's not lost just yet. You know, usually I have a backup plan with this kind of stuff. I don't have a backup plan for the onions. Don't have a backup plan for the potatoes. The brassicas, the way I'm seeing it, is if they don't get their act together in the next two weeks, I have to get them in the ground in the next two weeks. If they don't, if they're not at a reasonable size, because I outpotted them, I took them out of the cells, I put them in larger inserts. They're like in 1.5 inch inserts that have a two inch depth to them. So they've got plenty of soil now, but they're really looking sad. And again, if I can't get them to a reasonable size before April 15th, I think I'm wasting my time. They're not going to work out. And that whole thing is just going to be a wash. Now the Piracicaba and these guys over here, they're more later season. They're going to be there for most of the, the summer. So it's not a, it's not something I have to, uh, you know, really get right on the timing-wise uh, to the umph degree because heading broccoli and Brussels sprouts are some of the most difficult things you can grow here. And if you don't get the timing right, you just lose. So I think at this point I've lost on the Brussels already. I'm kind of giving up, I think. The heading broccoli, I think I might have a chance. But the rest of this stuff is just kind of have to be what it is, and that's it. The fennel will get in there. The snap peas will get in there. Everything else is in here and actually looking good. Anything I direct seeded looks great. Parsley, cilantro, I actually transplanted in. They look great. Even transplanted in some basil a little bit early this year. Um, the radishes look good, the arugula, the spinach, everything in there actually looks great. And I have like four different types of spinach, two different types of arugula. Um, we're definitely trying some different stuff this year um, to make sure that <coughs> we, uh, you know, we get a different taste on some of this stuff. So that was the main goal, I think. Uh, I wanted to really find um, a better arugula and also um, something a little bit different in the spinach category. Um, all right, so then that's kind of where we're at with the spring garden. Now, the summer garden, we're actually looking pretty good. And there's only really one big hiccup here. All the tomatoes came up well. I think I might start more of them tomorrow or something. I just got all the rest of my seeds in here. Um, I actually went a little nuts this year with the tomatoes. 
I mean, <laughs> I did go nuts. <laughs> I really did. I mean, there's so many varieties. Since I talked about the tomatoes I was going to grow, I've already added like 20 more varieties or something crazy. So there's more, there's way more that I found that seemed to be really well worth my time. This one here called Gardener Sweetheart. It's got a long hang time. We'll see. Got some others here like Taiga, Striped Roman, Tex Wine, Owens Purple. Carbon, Goose Creek, Reinhardt's Craft, Purple Sugar Cherry. There's so many varieties that um, I have added. It's an, it's insane. I mean, look at how many of this is now. And I think I have one too many. <laughs> so, um, I really found some interesting experts that might know what they're talking about. We're going to find out if they do this year. But some of like almost all of these were highly, highly recommended by somebody. This isn't just like a tomato that is good or great. This is like somebody at some point said this is like their best tomato or an absolute must grow. And I then figured, you know, it probably is a must grow. So we got a lot of tomato varieties and they're all coming up. They're all doing great. I'm transplanting them out two weeks from now, just like the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts. Um, well, not the Brussels sprouts, but <coughs> reason for that is I actually um, have the low tunnels set up. We, cre we created two more over the summer garden. So the whole summer garden is covered in tunnels. This whole area is covered in tunnels, which is amazing. So I'm going to have these tunnels um, giving these crops a huge head start to the season. There's also a tunnel here. So this is going to get a head start too. Everything I'm going to try to get in the ground two weeks from now. And if it's not ready, I'll have to wait a little bit. If I, for whatever reason, don't have seed that succeeded, I'll just direct seed it. Um, I've direct seeded, I think around May 1st under these tunnels last year in this location here, and everything came out fantastic. Best it ever did. So we're giving them a head start even further with the transplants. Um, probably save myself a whole month with some of these things. Um, but these tunnels create so much heat that I'm able to plant April 15th, no problem. I probably would plant earlier if I could. But I'm afraid of frost. So if a frost came in, I think they'd be okay. But I don't know. I didn't want to really risk it. So April 15th is my more comfortable date. And, uh, you know, even if I did it on May 1st, direct seeded, I would get so – the crops would be so early. But this year it's going to be even earlier. So I'm super excited. All the tomatoes, all these eggplants, all these peppers are going to do so well. They've all come up for the most part. They're all doing well um, from transplant. Again, I have more tomatoes here I need to start. But I could just wait. You know, I don't even need to, to start them. Um, I could very easily just, you know, direct seed them. Uh, the one big thing that hasn't been working out is the rootstock for the melons and the cucumbers. As you guys know, we're obsessed with the melons. We got all these varieties, even got cucumbers here for the uh, for actually um, grafting them onto squash rootstock. The squash rootstock's very disease resistant, super important, and also grows better at colder soil temperatures. I don't think that's a big deal as much anymore. I think it is a big deal, but um, the fact that these low tunnels are set up is going to be so key. So even if the rootstock doesn't work out, I haven't – here's my problem with the rootstock, by the way. I started the rootstock 
as a trial run, <clears throat> I started the rootstock and melon seeds on the same day. And they came up at different rates, obviously. Um, and what I, what I learned I needed to do was actually start the melon or the rootstock a week after I start the melon seeds. That way they line up well and you can do your grafting and actually have them at a similar diameter of, uh, and life cycle of the, of the seedling. Problem is, again, I, I started them on the same day. The second time around when I did this for real, I was running out of time. So I had to do it all just a week later. Unfortunately, a week later isn't really working out either. Um, really quite crazy. Uh, the rootstock isn't coming up. It seems like, I don't know what happened this time around. Um, it probably came up either yesterday or today. I haven't been out there to look. It's, uh, it's been too cold and whatnot, but I would imagine hopefully soon I can at least attempt it. I would like to try if I can get them to graft and work out that's a huge plus, huge benefit. If I can't, then all is not lost because I have extra plants with all of these melons and all of these cucumbers. I put in three seeds. One was to splice for grafting. The second was to actually plant. And the third was just a backup. So I, I did a nice backup plan here <laughs> at least. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And then if for whatever reason the graphs don't work out, it's okay, I believe, because these melon plants are going to be underneath this, this plastic, getting a huge head start to the season, much warmer soil temperatures, away from the wind. They're going to transplant well. Um, they're not going to have any pest pressure. So they're going to do really, 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 really well. And they're going to get off on the right foot. I'm going to have a successful melon year, I think. I think it's almost a guarantee at this point so two weeks from now that's what's what's going to happen is that they're going in the ground um whether i like it or not and hopefully i can get some to take graft wise very very soon i hope to be doing that and um it takes about a week for them to heal over and then hopefully i can transplant them in at that point so I'm going to look probably to start transplanting things in about a week from now, but I'm not going to hold my breath just yet. We're going to have to see, wait and see what the deal is. Um, just so we can be sure that's it. Um, and that sort of wraps up the garden, you know, um, the rest of the stuff here at the community garden, I have to get this set up. Um, Hopefully around the 15th again, around that date is when everything's going to kind of happen. Um, getting the the whole fence fencing set up is really the key. There's a lot of deer. Uh, there's a lot of people. So you got to get everything kind of fenced in well, and then you can start planting. And uh, we'll see. I have um, one of my best friends, his mom is a pro at this so we'll uh be basically taking her lead on setting the whole thing up and then the rest of the stuff in here i have to wait so i can i can't plant this anyway i would love to plant the potatoes and onions now would have loved to have planted them a month ago <laughs> but uh can't do that so we're waiting patiently and then the rest of the stuff needs warmer soil temperatures anyway the tomatoes will go in I started those a little bit earlier than I would have liked, but it is what it is. Um, these are going to be grown in a Florida weave style. I have about 12 plants. One is the Principe Borghese, and the other one is the Pianolo, which, uh, believe it or not, Nolo de Vesuvio. Here we go. This, These two tomatoes are the most versatile, it seemed like, have the most useless, uses, and also, for me, seem the most impressive. So you can use them for drying, um, you can use them for uh, making paste, and you can also use them to hang to extend the season. So they're 
really durable tomatoes that can be out there for a long time. Thicker skins allows them to be hung. Um, they get concentrated flavor, really good, amazing tasting tomatoes. Um, not many other tomatoes are like that. So I figure because they're so versatile and, and durable, they're going to go to the community garden and in more massive quantities, I'll be growing them. Yeah, that's just like pretty darn special right there. Um, this I'm excited to make sauce out of them. So that <coughs> that's kind of it there for the community garden. Uh, the actual garden. We're, I'm excited to see what comes up. I'm going to be eating a salad very soon, almost every day. The arugula is way ahead. Really surprised by that. Um, still a decent amount to do. The strawberry bed's done. And I just got the yacon in, so I have to put that in. Just got an Olympic berry, a different type of blackberry. I'm excited to put that in. It's similar to the Marion berry. By the way, the Marion berry is amazing, as I said. It really is worth buying. If you guys are trying to add anything this year, first off, you got to have a couple things. Where we should just I should just do a whole video on just that. But certainly, you know, if you can find a persimmon and you don't already have one, you got to get it. The Mar de Bois strawberry, probably an apricot tree, a pawpaw tree, and then I would argue some of the berries that you can grow, like the Marion berry. The Olympic berry is new for me. That one's supposed to be even better. Who knows? And then, of course, some of these uh, these raspberries as well. They're just so easy to grow. Um, but I would certainly, of all of the berries... My favorite is the Marion Berry. It tastes like a raspberry, but it's like eating a blackberry. So it's a weird experience, and it isn't a huge flavor explosion in your mouth. Um, I also really like the Asian pears. And, um, hmm. What are my, uh, where is my, um, other fruit trees. Here we go. The Gumi. Oh, yeah. Forgot about the Gumi. Got to grow that. Got to grow the grapes. And probably a Kiwi if you can fit one in. You got to fit two actually in. Those hardy Kiwi. Alpine strawberries. Yeah, those are my big recommendations. a <laughs> what is that peach i had the uh indian free peach is insanely good the early blush apricot so yeah there, there's a lot of choices here guys um gotta grow it so on to the figs real quick we'll do a separate update i think just on the figs for sure but a lot of the figs have taken as cuttings. Um, we had a really overall successful year of rooting, and um, I didn't really pay too much attention to the to the cuttings <laughs> at all. Didn't feed them once. Um, barely took care of them. In fact, it is way better to. If I had, if you like, if you if you really had to overwater a fig cutting or underwater it, a hundred times out of a hundred, it would be underwater it. So um, that's kind of what I did. Was I just really didn't try to really avoid overwatering. There was one moment where I did overwater some things, and I regret it. But it is what it is. Um, we really had losses mostly due to that and just due to the fact that some cuttings just don't make it, you know. Um, but there's a long list of cuttings here, new varieties that I ended up acquiring or making more copies of, and I was very pleased to see success. We have 
a lot more that we started in the greenhouse of rootstock, uh, some of Texas BA1, others of unknown varieties. Uh, we also have different random various uh, varieties that we've started in the greenhouse. Uh, very soon, I still have more wood, by the way, that I need to root. And I'm going to be rooting all of that basically outdoors or in the greenhouse. Um, I have to construct myself a little bit of a frame with plastic. Um to get myself the right outdoor environment. But as soon as that happens, we're gonna be in business and we'll start cuttings in pots outside under plastic and in an area that doesn't get too much light, but it gets light that I have access to and I can water easily, but control exactly how much water is in the, in the soil. Um, that's really key. So that's gonna be a thing we have many more cuttings actually to start. Our grafting we have to do. I have counted 23 rootstock one ga in one gallon size pots. I'm going to be grafting. Um, also have a lot of other rootstock in larger pots. So we're doing a lot of grafting. Even have persimmons to graft of uh, the variety Sejo. We got to graft. Girardi mulberry trees um, so I can take them with me when I move and let's see what else the fig trees um, so the fig tree cuttings we move them outside by the way I've took half of them out of the indoor rooting environment and moved them outside they're adjusting to the light right now it is actually going to get to 26 tomorrow night. So they could potentially even see a frost. I, I, I don't think we will see a frost, but if there is a, you know, forecast for frost, I need to move them somewhere out of that. But they're going to be outside either in the greenhouse or underneath the rooting environment that I just talked about, getting themselves more established um, as this next month goes by outside um so half of them are in the closet trying to move them out of there because it's just it's so annoying to deal with that closet there's not enough room the artificial lights are just not good enough i need to upgrade the lights and i can't get in there and water as easily as i need to i can't get in there and feed as easy as i need to so to take better care of these trees I, that's what i need to do uh we're gonna be <laughs> Um, selling some trees but not until late May so you know, someone's going to ask but we still have a while away before I uh, even ha will have the trees ready and available um, I still have to really a lot of them are awake by the way underneath the sunroom however I need to actually rejuvenation prune a lot of them so that they're healthy and that way you guys when you buy them are getting a good healthy tree or if I'm not selling them, I'm rejuvenation pruning them for myself. Um, <clears throat> just trying to make sure you guys get a, the healthiest, strongest tree possible. And I definitely know how to do that. So um, we have plenty of trees that because COVID really delayed our sales last year of the actual trees. If the post office is slow again, again, we're going to be I'm going to have to hold off. Um, but we're going to change some things around, I think, as well with shipping and, and whatnot. And we've been learning, you know, it's, uh, wasn't born a salesman and never had a customer service job. So, um, we are slowly ironing this whole thing out and realizing why things should be done the way that they should be done. Um, Anyway, enough on that. The other thing on the figs I want to mention is that um, the figs on the patio are going to come out. They're going to go on the patio soon, but I'm not inclined to get them out as early as I did last year. Because we had some late frosts, I will wait as long as possible. I don't see much of a big benefit to getting them out there earlier. I think that's kind of a waste for the most part. 
Um, if I can get them out there on the 15th or around that, that'd be great. But the forecast may turn and I'm more inclined to wait until like the 25th of April or something like that before I really commit to moving them outside. That includes the pomegranates too, um, all that stuff. The figs underneath the low tunnels, uh, have woken up and they woke up a few days ago. It took them a little bit longer than I had suspected them that they would. Um, if we get enough temperatures here, things are going to start putting out fruit actually. And that's going to be awesome because it really should only take about from when they wake up, it should really only take two to three weeks for some of these trees, assuming they get enough growing degree days, it's 550 they need and they'll set fruit. So I imagine that'll take three weeks. So let's estimate that's 20 days, three weeks. Some varieties, once you see the fruit, takes about 70 for them to be ripe. So for a total of 90 for me to see ripe fruits from today, 90 days is three months. Three months from today puts us at July 1st. So when I conservatively estimated July 15th, that was really a conservative estimate. Even though we are behind a week. Actually, we are behind two weeks from where I had originally um, estimated. <clears throat> so I said the most ideal scenario... The tunnels get set up on the 1st of March, the 15th, they're, they're woken up. And then by, let's say, April 1st, they have fruit on them. And then, again, that puts us really, actually, sometime in June, I think. Because if you have fruit, I said 90 days puts us at July 1st. But really, even some of them you could be looking at even in June. So I still think July 15th is not a date out of the question, even though things, again, like I said, are behind. Um, they're behind in many senses. You know, the fact that they took a while to wake up and they're behind because the tunnels didn't get set up right away. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking really good with the figs. We're looking really good with anything related to the summer. Um, the brassicas always struggle and, uh, the onions and the, and the potatoes are doing their thing, hopefully. So that's kind of it here guys with the, with the figs, I think, um, I'm going to update you guys more on the timeline. I know. People are curious, you know, well, what should I be doing right now, Ross? Like, well, what are you doing right now? And that's, I, I always like to show you guys, but just go to our blog, figboss.com, and you can just put in the timeline, the fig timeline, and you'll know exactly what to do at any point. I need to update this a little bit, make this a little bit more accurate, but we're going to be doing things like feeding and um, moving them out very soon, and then feeding them, watering them. And then, of course, the biggest thing of the whole year is probably thinning them. And we'll talk about thinning because thinning is really something that we always did, but we didn't know exactly why we did it. Um, <clears throat> we really f figured it out, and uh, that was the biggest thing I was missing. And it will, because of this new knowledge, completely changes how I can... Uh, get the most productivity out of my trees. So, yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that. And, uh, yeah, that's it. So, anyway, guys, thank you so much here for watching this one. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. We'll be coming at you guys with more videos, more podcasts. I think uh, something that people should hear again is, like, what, what should I grow, you know? Um, now that it is you know april it is a little bit too late now to be thinking about that ordering fruit trees and different things through the mail um but there is some things that you could still buy at this point if you're interested maybe you got into this a bit late what are the things that you would that i would recommend the most um i'll have to do that for you guys some recommendations all right everybody take care we'll see you soon uh, catch you for the next one.